afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another live session with Emirates NBD. We hope you're all being safe and healthy, and most importantly, socially responsible. So as we navigate through these challenging times and adapt to this new change, we're bringing you a series of new live sessions that will, cre that will help you create your brand and find opportunities to build the career and the job you always wanted. So today is the first session of six that we're going to have under the theme career management that's led under uh, Shane Phillips, who's the CEO of managing consultancy, the Phillips Group. So Shane is also the author of the book, Find Your Dream Job, and has previously hosted his own live radio show called Eye on Korea on Dubai Eye 103.8. He's also hosted his TV show on ZTV and Star Time, and Star TV, apologies. So Shane, without further ado, thank you so much. Uh, for your time and for joining us today. Oh, thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, I didn't know you knew about the TV shows and everything. So uh, I guess you did some research. So thank you for the- We did, we did. <laughs> so Shane, can you just tell us a little bit uh, about your background? Sure. Uh, well, I was basically born into an executive search. My father started our company in 1984 in Canada. So. Um, it's really been a tradition in our family of working with executives, placing them in jobs. And, uh, you know, when we're cutting turkey at Christmas, we're, we're actually the dialogue will be about assessments and, and placements. And so over the years, um, you know, we've really uncovered a lot of patterns and universal truths that we felt so are so important that we've 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 published books about it. We've printed it. We try to create a lot of content around it. And a lot of them will be game changers. Uh, you really, uh, we've worked with people who have seen a thousand percent increase in salary, for example, over a period of time, of course. Uh, we've had, I've worked with three homeless people who in 36 months were making over $150,000 a year. So the principles are really powerful, really believe in them, and it's really been a life's work handed down from, from father to son. Okay, great. So Shane, there are so many life coaches out there and career coaches in the market today who also say that they have the key tools to unlocking a successful career. But for our audience today and for whoever is watching our live session, why should they follow the, the career advice that you're sharing with us today? Yeah, I think that's a, a great question. I think number one, you know, in our family, we've put a roof over our head and put food on the table by placing people in jobs. So Mm -hmm. We actually make money by placing people in jobs. So that makes our advice have that extra teeth and the extra claw, uh, the extra fangs that you need to really get results. So there's, I think there's a much harder edge to, to what we do. And uh, rather than being a softer feel uh, consultant who's really making their money on getting fees from consulting. Right. Um, I think that's one. Two, it's just the long, long experience that, you know, my sister's in the business, I'm in the business, my brother-in-law. I mean, there's been so many people who've actually, um, you know, have been have been worked. And then also the fact that we've worked globally. So, you know, from New York to Toronto to Dubai, Riyadh, and then myself have been here since 2008, placing people across the GCC uh, for 12 years. And, you know, we work with clients if, like Al-Raji, Mohedem Group, Sedco, the Zubairs. Uh, you know, we, we, we place so many people. Uh, I don't want to mention my clients in UAE in case they get sensitive. But there's a lot uh, that we've, we've done. And so we really understand the market. We understand the region. And our advice um, is on the money. So uh, in managing your career, I want to ask you, what's the one thing that you consider is is the most important thing in your opinion? I think the most important thing in career or in life is mm -hmm. really going to be your vision, your vision of, of who you want to become and where you're going. And I think that's a question that a lot of people don't ask. And it's one that's going to give you inherently uh, your competitive advantage. And um, one of the uh, paradigms that you actually have to break down is this mm -hmm. idea that we have been trained from school to believe that if I'm going to be greatness, you know, if I'm going to be an Olympic champion, for example, I need to be gifted. I need to have some kind of uh, be a prodigy child. 
And so as children, we don't feel that we have that geniusness. And then we say, and then we abandon our dreams of greatness and settle for, settle for mediocrity or set goals that are realistic and achievable. And that is, that's the big mistake. A lot of people um, uh, are really only successful because they set a vision and actually are not that talented. And this, this is a major paradox, which I will on this session actually challenge. So, and, and we'll show you that it's not actually the case. I have some examples. I don't know if you want me to go into those now or you have sure. some other questions. Yeah. Um, Saad, I don't know if I can get uh, my slides Sorry, going. I just have a quick question. So we hear a lot about, you know, the word vision and, and how important it is, but what is it really, I mean, in, in related to someone's job, how can we put that into context? Sure. Let me just show you an example of how it works. Uh, yeah. Side, can I get slide four, please? If we can just uh, get to the, if you see here. Okay, so right here, let's take a simple career example. Say I'm starting a burger shop. And, um, you know, this is something everybody can relate to. Everybody, I hope, has had a burger at least or enjoys them. Uh, and uh, even vegans have vegan burgers, so we're we're yeah. covered here. Um, but let's say I want to start up a burger place and say I, say I'm rich, and then once the first one makes money, I'm gonna like open up 500 locations. So what do we really need? And I don't know if there if we can get the participation of the audience, but maybe they could write in what they think. Number one, people would normally say you need good beef or you need good buns, or you need good condiments, or you need a quality product, or you need a really quality place. And when you look at the actual market is, I don't know if you know what the best selling hamburger in the world is, but can I get the next slide? If you look here, I have a picture of the best selling hamburger in the world. We know that. And uh, <laughs> this is this is the number one selling, this is a Big Mac. And yeah. so when you look at it, the, the, the there's, a, there's a ton of other burgers in town with have more beef which have better beef, which even you can get Wagyu beef or, or whatever. And so if you look at the next slide here, you can see that we have McDonald's has 69 million uh, customers a day. And there is a movie which I was talking about with our uh, technical support guy here. I don't know what his actual title is, but Saad is saying this is the movie founder that you can watch. And when you look at that, you realize that uh, McDonald's was running with one restaurant for 14 years and the McDonald's brothers had all the talent they had all the knowledge they're the ones who knew how to make the hamburgers they had all the skills they were debatably one of the best hamburger makers in the world because it was really fast but their business went nowhere they had hit that plateau and it wasn't until Ray Kroc came and said we're going to be the number one restaurant in the world we're going to be the largest restaurant franchise in the world that in the next 14 years, they open thousands of restaurants. And, and you can see the power of vision that actually trumps the quality of the product, the quality of, of the burger. And so how does this relate to your career in the sense that a lot of people feel that I really need to be good at my job and you're missing the number one driver. Like if you look at the McDonald's example, they were great at their job, but they were not finding their true success until they had a vision. And so vision is really the lever that's going to catapult you forward. And it will it will compensate for your gaps. If I can show you another example, um, if you take a look at this next slide. Uh, and I told you, uh, no, that's the slide actually just before that. There you go. So say that you wanted to be a music star. And I said, hey, you know, you'd say, hey, you need to have a great voice or you have to be musically talented. And uh, if you didn't, you wouldn't, you would say, God, you'd be crazy. And let alone if I told you I'm going to be the number one pop star from a country. And if you look at the next slide here, of course, you look at the number one pop star for Korea is Gangnam Style. In fact, he's the first Korean artist to ever hit the global charts. He's the first person to hit over a billion views on YouTube. And uh, his parents were actually trying to talk him out of going into the music industry because his dad is actually a, a very successful businessman. And uh, Gangnam Style said, no, actually his name's not even Gangnam Style. His song is so successful that you know him as Gangnam Style. His name is PSY. But 
PSLI I said, no, I'm going to be the number one pop star. And it was that vision that really trumped everything. And mm -hmm. when I deal with people, they just throw vision away and they don't think it's really relevant. And I think that is uh, a real, a real eye opener um, after working for decades with people. And uh, as I was saying, actually, with Saad before we started, you know, like when I was sitting in Kentucky Fried Chicken one day and not proud that, you know, I was there. But it's true. All of us <laughs> fall to that yeah. smell or whatever it is. And I'm biting into that chicken and I'm like, man, this is not that good. But this restaurant is so successful, you know, as a businessman, as an entrepreneur uh, or sorry, as a business person, I, I'm always looking at like what makes this business successful. And the restaurant's messy. The, 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 the furniture is cheap. The chairs are plastic. And I'm like, if, if you were just assessing this at first glance, you would think like this is a mess. And I'm like biting into it. And another other voice in my head is like, this is the best selling chicken in the world. And then it hit me is that you don't have to be number one to be number one in the world. You don't actually have to have the best product, the best service, the best generally, whether it's your chicken or it's your CEO or it's the highest paid marketing person or the highest paid supply chain person or the highest paid CFO. They're not necessarily the best, but they had a vision. And they had that drive to see it through. And when you throw vision away, you're like a Ferrari that's never getting out of first gear. You're locking off the rest of the gears to really get into high gear, to really get those RPMs up into that boiling point or it's like water, you know. Yeah. You're boiling water. If you're at 99 degrees, you're not boiling. So it's a lot of heat, a lot of action going, but you never get the boil on. And a lot of people just don't hit that stride. And the fact is that someone with less talent than you, less resources than you, but has a more compelling vision will outperform you. And there's a lot of talented singers who never get seen. There's a lot of really great restaurants that go to business. Mm -hmm. Sorry, you're going to ask me a question. You, you're going to have to just cut me off because our, <laughs> no, so I'm really passionate about this stuff. So. No, it's a great discussion, actually. So for just to recap for our viewers who just tuned in, today we're talking about vision and how vision is super important for anyone who wants to brand themselves or who wants to get the dream job that they want in the market. So just a recap on our discussion. So are you saying that vision will outperform at a certain point skill or experience, talent, money, or basically it, it, no. the vision will outperform everything? That's correct. So not just at a certain point, it does. So look at, you know, look at Dubai is the perfect example. I mean, the concepts that I'm presenting to you are universal truths. And you walk down the street and when something's a universal truth, you can see it. Like when whoever the guy was, Columbus said, the world is round. You go on the beach, you can see the horizon. It's curved. So, yeah. you know, you walk down the street, you can go into McDonald's, you can go into KFC, you can go look at the Burj Khalifa. Now, the Emiratis were, are not known for the world being the world's greatest architects. You know, that went to the Greeks and the Romans and the whatever and everything they're building. Uh, so all of a sudden, these guys, are these you know, the Emiratis come on the stage and they build the world's greatest tower, the tallest tower, that's ever been made. And what made it happen was a vision. The vision of the ruler of Dubai is so powerful that it attracts people from all over the world come here. You know, you come off this, you go to any business meeting and you got, you got 10 people in the meeting, you got 10 different nationalities, almost guaranteed, right? Unless, mm -hmm. unless it's, you know, unless, you know, anyway, you know what I'm saying? So the, yeah. uh, the point is, is that vision built this city. Vision build all the greats. There's not a single society that was built to greatness that did not have vision. There is not a single accomplishment that stands the test of time as a wonder of the world of greatness that did not start with vision. Right. And you yourself will never find your true potential unlocked until you have that vision, until you have that grandest right. vision. A lot of people don't have the self-confidence to stand up and say, when you look at Sheikh, you know, his, his highness, Sheikh, Mo, Sheikh Mohammed, he has a huge self-confidence to say, you know, out of all the countries, and he's not even a country, but he competes, you know, Dubai, they compare Dubai to countries. That's how powerful mm -hmm. he is. 
And, you know, he says, I'm going to, I'm going to compete on the world stage, you know, so you have to have the right. confidence, you have to have the ambition. And a lot of people don't have the, the honesty to sit back and say, oh, actually, I have low self confidence, I need to fix that first, fix your confidence, build your ambition, grab your vision, find your success. So Shane, then how can someone focus on themselves or, or set the vision for set the right vision for themselves? Right. So I'll show you a couple exercises, you know, okay. that we could do. Um, so if I could get slide 12 and I'm going to show you the slide It's so simple. And a lot of the stuff I might say, it might go against what you believe in. So you might not use it, but this slide is probably one of the most powerful things that you can see. So what you look at is when I'm placing people in jobs, I'm really identifying the top 1% of people in the market. And what do the top 1% people do to focus? So part of vision and career strategy is, is your focus. Mm -hmm. So let's look at, you know, the first slide. The first exercise we'll do is helping you focus. And number two is how do we set a vision and we'll have an exercise that we'll go through quickly. So here, if you look at the green dots, these are your relationships. And if you go to a house party of somebody who's in a lower income bracket, and then you go to a house party of someone who's in the top 5% of incomes, you will notice some distinct changes. In the, in the lower income house party, you'll see an eclectic mix of personalities. Oh, here's my friend Dave, he works in logistics, and here's my friend John, and he works in IT, and here's my friend, she's a banker, and here's da 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 da, da. And you have this kind of mix, and, and they actually enjoy the fact that they are eclectic, and they're like, oh, I get along with all people, and da da blah blah. If you go to like Jamie Dimon's house for a party, it's going to be mostly the financial high street of New York that will be there. And mm -hmm. if you go to, uh, I was watching a documentary last night on Dapper Dan, like one of the top, uh, you know, designers. When you go to the, you know, you go to a, a party at Versace's, it's going to be all fashion people. So you will see that their professional relationships are highly focused in one area. The other thing you'll notice is that usually they're there with an agenda. So if you're invited to somebody who's in the top 1%, they probably have an agenda with you. They probably have a project or something down the road that you somehow will be affiliated. So they have this link between their personal and their professional. Their personal relationships as well will also be really focused. So if you go to Silicon Valley and you know you see Steve Jobs and Wozniak and all these, these guys were childhood friends and they're playing football together or they're playing tennis together or they're hanging out and they're, they're together or you go and see a Bollywood director and he's hanging out, his friends are actors and blah, 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 blah. So uh, you, you see this interlink that you're choosing your personal relationships and focus your personal relationships within your industry. And then your intimate relationships, a lot of people say, Shane, you know, you're going too far with this, that your husband or wife are actually focused also on the career. But this, I'm not making this stuff up. Again, it's the universal truth. You can go back and you look at the samurai class of Japan. They were not allowed to marry outside of samurai. You go back and look at the kings and queens of England, you, you know, until recently, and you saw how that ended. Now the royal family of uh, England is 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 running to, uh, to Canada, uh, you know, because of whatever they married outside of the, uh, 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 and so they broke the circle and immediately you see a loss of power and a loss of wealth. So these three have to be set together. Then the next one, I'll just go around the circle quickly, yeah. is your community service. So here you can find that in a lower income personality, a person might work in logistics and then they might uh, volunteer for disabled kids, which is great. That's good. There's nothing wrong with that. But when you look at somebody who say, a high, you know, like my friend, he's a, he's a very high end investment banker. So his charity, he set up investment bankers uh, for good. And they go to destitute countries or, low, or emerging markets and they set up project financing for free uh, to help companies do water projects and dam projects and hydro projects, which help those communities. And so, or you see like a doctor who's a high-end surgeon, instead of going and working with, with orphans, 
gets on an airplane and, and goes and teaches uh, surgeons in Rwanda or in a refugee camp and volunteers their time. Your impact will be much more powerful and then your ability to tie in. So even if you're junior, uh, or not junior, but say you're not a surgeon, say you're a secretary, you're a personal assistant, that's still a very important job, it's a very tough job. Mm -hmm. But you could then say, hey, secretaries for social good or whatever, you start to become a leader in your function and you pull that together. And then the geography is self-explanatory, I believe, you know, you don't want to be an investment banker, uh, you know, if you're not in a financial hub. And your hobbies and recreational activities, so call up people in your industry and say, hey, you know, call up your competitors, go out, go hiking with them, go biking with them, and have that dialogue where ideas actually germinate. And then the final piece is what I call knowledge acquisition, which is your reading, writing, and your education, your courses. So how are you acquiring knowledge? A lot of people are what I call professionally illiterate. Professionally illiterate means that you have not read a single book about your profession in the last five years. If you have not read a book about your profession, then I, you know, I, I would actually sack you. I would tell you to go find something that, you know, if you're not interested in reading about your profession, go find a profession that you're excited about that you want to read about. If you don't want to read about what you do and spend 80% of your life doing, then get out of it now. And I think that's really important. And then I think you look at um, people who love what they do. They're always taking courses and upgrading. So this is a quick, I hope that wasn't too long. I know we're on the clock this here. Today, interesting. So. so just to sum it up, first of all, you have the relationships to keep different relationships. Then you have networking with others and community service. And then the last one was to kind of get educated within your field as well. So to get cultured within your field. Yeah, or what we would call it in an assessment process, we call that we test for intellectual curiosity. So what are you doing to really, really learn about your, are you, are you just curious about, hey, you know, what makes a great bank or what makes a great FMCG company, et cetera. And, what, and, and if you apply this circle, if you take anybody and you apply it, you will find that the highest paid people adhere to this structure. And you can also see like, who's the, you know, we can say that the queen is probably one of the richest people in England. She would... Uh, adhere to this immaculately. You know, this is so interesting to me because I actually, I read that somewhere, but I didn't really understand that. So this clarified a lot, actually. So what is the, we hear of something when we talk about vision, we hear of something called the five by five dream box. And yes. it's something I think we were talking about a bit just right before we got into this live session. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, yes. So if you look at the uh, the slide, it's uh, it's slide. Uh, yeah, there you go. So this was created by my family. It's copyrighted by us, and it's a program that we use with with our candidates when working with them. Um, and uh, you know, basically, what it is is people are kind of like lost because they're not really taught how to create a vision, and and, and you, you know, you know all this stuff, but you just like really don't know how to put it together. It's kind of like you know that you like spaghetti, but the fact that you're in the kitchen and you have the meat and you have the sauce and you have all the vegetables, because we've never, if you haven't been taught how to cook spaghetti, you can't make it, even though you have everything you need. And that's how people are. They have everything they need, but they just haven't been shown how to put the recipe together. So this is kind of like your recipe of how to put your vision together. So you look at it and you say, how do I, and what's the crux at the, at, at, what's the underlying factor of this is, how do I reach peak performance as an individual? So I want, and that's where you really start to enjoy your, your life. You enjoy your job. You enjoy things when you're great at what you do, you know? And uh, so, for example, for me, uh, like writing my book was hell because I'm an extroverted personality. And if you put me on a stage with 10,000 people watching me, I will really like, I'll be the best day of my life. I'll enjoy it, right? And then you take somebody else and it would be the total reverse. Like they would be mortified yeah. to be on the stage and they would enjoy writing the book. So mm -hmm. this is because my five by five dream box is off for being an author. It's not really my thing. Although <laughs> I feel I need to do it to help people. So I, so I wrote it because I want to help people. So I write out like really what's your values. And so like for me, helping others is, is, is really important. Like we have it in our, in our 
company, that we're a socially responsible company. We have to do CSR every quarter. And so what's really important to you? And you don't, you, so you have your values, your skills, your energizing activity. So energizing activity is something that people ignore because one of the things you're also taught growing up is to be tough, you know, and to, and to push on. And we always have these stories of our heroes who endure great suffering and they come out successful at the end. So when we're in a job and it's tough and it's de-energizing us and it's getting us down, we feel like, like our heroes that we've been taught, we're going to fight through it. Well, it's not always, sometimes it is the case, but not always. So understand when you're in a job that never really energizes you, you're not going to reach peak performance. If you're tough, you can still be good at it, but you're never going to self-actualize. And then what are your intrinsic motivators? Um, so for example, some people might buy a Ferrari and two people might buy the Ferrari and one guy, he's just really a sports enthusiast and he loves going on the track and he loves going fast. He's adrenaline junkie. The other guy, he probably never goes over 110 kilometers an hour with the car. And in fact, he probably drives it really slow in Jumeirah Beach. So everyone sees him with the top down because he wants the prestige. He wants the social status of the Ferrari. So the motivator for the brand can be totally different. Mm -hmm. So what's your intrinsic motivator? Uh, do you want prestige? Do you want exclusivity? Do you, you know, are you motivated by, by whatever it is? And then your personality. Uh, so if somebody wanted to was well, listen to this, you could take out a pen and paper and you could put these five headings down. And if you want, I can just walk you through each one quickly. Actually, that would be good because I'm interested to know about the energizing activities. OK, so this is so if you just go to the next slide here, uh, this is a really cool exercise, which uh, I love, which is just take a, a small pen and paper with you that fits in your pocket or your purse or whatever and pen. And every time that you're doing something and you feel your energy is just like doosh, down, you write it down. And every time in that day that you feel like, boom, you're, you're like pumped up, you get a burst of energy, you write it down. So I really noticed it. Like I had that radio show for three years on Dubai I 103.8 on careers. And uh, I remember working like a 15 hour day and I had gone to see clients in Abu Dhabi and I was driving back and I was literally, I had to pull over twice and rest because I was falling asleep on the, at the wheel. Like I was scared I was going to pass out. And I literally pulled into the, that, those were the old days when the studio was in Studio City. And I drove in like hanging off the steering with my fingernails. And then we did the show and it was a two hour show from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. And by 11 p.m. at night, I couldn't sleep because I was so charged up. And you can really see that when you're doing something that excites you, it's like you get that energy. And that's what you really need to outperform the competition. If you're competing against somebody who's energized about what they're doing and you're de-energized, you're going to be infinitely on a back foot. Um, and so it's just, it's just called taking an energy log and do that for two weeks. And then you start to realize that, hey, everything in my job is de-energizing me or like, hey, almost like 90% of my job energy is just these two things. Maybe you can delegate them. Maybe you can make some small changes and you can get some big results by understanding this. Then the next one is your five strongest skills. In order to test this out, you want to go and ask because we have self-bias, right? Yeah. So I may think that, Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm a really good speaker on this session. And everybody came off saying, oh, Shane sucks so bad. That was horrible or whatever it is. So you want to get feedback and say, hey, you know, what do you see as my five strongest skills? And people will be like, look, you know, you're not a public speaker. So say that off or whatever it is, you know, get the feedback and then see there's always going to be a bit of a gap where you feel you're really good and yeah. maybe it's not. So just write your own down and then take inventory from five, six people, and then zero in on those. And then, and you might, people might see skills in you that you don't see in yourself as well. Because they are like, I've seen people who don't think that they're salespeople because salespeople has this, can, like this negative thing, like, oh, I'm not yeah. a salesperson. And it's like, no, the fact that you are not trying to sell actually makes you a really good salesperson. And so, you know, so it's a discovery. 
Your personality traits, these should be pretty easy. Like what are the personality traits that you like? And we all have personality traits that we don't like or that we want to minimize, you know? Okay. And I think SAD's on the skills now. So this, the next one is, yeah? Would people know their, their favorite personality traits or is it better to ask someone every time? I mean, something that- <laughs> Well, you could take similar, actually the, per, the personality- to the, Pardon? Similar to the skills that we were just talking about. It's better yeah. to ask someone about them. Yeah, and you can also take a psychometric test because a psychometric test actually will test for your personality traits. In fact, it's really kind of based on trait-based psychology or, you know, like you have the PSY 16, which tests 16 personality traits, and you can actually see what are your favorite personality traits and then which ones are your gaps as well. So, uh, so, so yeah, and then you also have traits that you don't like, that you want to minimize or what we call your character defects, but we're not dealing, that's a different, that's a different section. So this is for your vision. You just want to focus on the ones that you really like about, you love, you love yourself when you're being what? Well, you love, you're, you're, you're impressed with yourself when, which of your traits are really shining. And mm -hmm. yeah, so I think a psychometric test, you could also ask people. Um, and then this one is now these, these next few ones get a bit more complex and Generally, when I work with a candidate, we have to redo this section like three or four times because mm -hmm. nobody really talks to you about it, but it's really critical. It's just like, what are your values? What do you really value? And what's strange about this one is that sometimes your values come from places where you've been hurt or really negative things that have happened to you. So, uh, for example, if a child has grown up in an abusive household, then, uh, you know, he will have a big value for family and for justice. Or, you know, if somebody uh, has seen their, their, has lost a loved one to a disease, they'll have a huge value for health and you, you might watch them, you know, eating. Or you've seen somebody who uh, parents suffered from substance abuse and, you know, they won't go near any vices or anything. So you, you, you we, and, and what we're always taught is to look at the positives. So for this yep. exercise, you want to really look at like, what are some of the worst things that have happened to you and explore those and, and open those up. And if you do this right, actually, um, because sometimes when something negative happens to us, say, for example, if I was abused, then I might have a resentment towards the person who abused me. But under this process, I actually use it as a strength of power and strength. So for example, one of my friends was in Uganda and her nanny was killed during the genocide on the side of the road. And she has become one of the biggest social activists in Africa. At the age of 18, she already built a hospital and whatever. So this negative event has actually created such a beautiful blossoming in her life. Not that she would ever be grateful that her, uh, that her nanny was killed, but she can see it as a positive way of shaping her success, if it makes any sense. So, for example, if you take the case of Muhammad Ali, Muhammad Ali started actually life as Clashes Clay. For those millennials, Muhammad Ali was a boxer, was one of the greatest boxers. Alive. I don't know if I'm dating myself, but, um, you know, he really didn't get his stride until he realized that Clashes Clay was his slave name and that African-Americans were being hung and killed. And that when he got in the ring, he wasn't fighting for himself, that he was standing up for black rights and that he was and then he became an African-American leader. And that, you know, his fight on in the ring was so much larger than himself that he became a champion that was just unstoppable to even this day that he still referenced. And so that mm -hmm. real power, that vision comes from him saying, wait a second, we were slaves, we were hung, we were lynched, we were killed. I'm going to onboard that. And now, and that's what made him become a born again Muslim. And he became Muhammad Ali. Mm -hmm. Amazing mm -hmm. stuff. So it's, it's really a deep slide. I don't know, we can't go into it too much. But uh, the next one is the motivational drivers. So what's really your driver? You know, some people... You know, if you grow up in, and there's no shame here because some people, if you grow up homeless, you will really be motivated by money, you know, because money represents security. It, rec it represents stability to you. So you want that. So then maybe we dig a bit deeper and you say, oh, I'm driven by having security, by, by increased that. So what is really driving you? So when you look back at your happiest time in your career, 
And you say, what was it really about that? Was it the prestige? Was it the spotlight? Was it uh, the spontaneity? Was it the, some people love the rush, you know, the, the, the ambiguity of a job. So if you're a trader or a stock trader, not knowing if you're going to be fired the next day, for some people energizes them, believe it or not. So, mm -hmm. so what are those drivers? And so you put all this together, just as I wrap up here, because I know we're on the clock, but, uh, 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 you know, this stuff is really deep and it's, it's really hard to just to do it on a summary level. But if you fill this dream box out and then in the middle, it starts to really become obvious if your job fits or not. When you look at this visually, you look at it visually and you say, hey, this is what energizes me, but this is what I'm doing. And mm -hmm. when you, the other just caveat before I uh, give you a chance to speak, sorry. And I just, one little caveat I'll just put in here is that when you look at this, Try not to, if your job doesn't fit, try not to switch industries. Try to find a job that, that stays in your industry. Just to give you a quick example, you know, we had a stockbroker and he didn't, his dream box didn't fit being a stockbroker and he wanted to be more people oriented and da, da da da. So instead of changing out of the financial services industry, he became a reporter for financial services. And because he had that industry knowledge, he outperformed the other journalists because he used to be a stockbroker. And mm -hmm. so by staying in your industry, you really can create more value than, than you know, it's like you get in the shower and, the, and, and, and it's cold. So you jump out and then you hit the heat all the other way and then you burn yourself because now the shower is too hot and you vacillate it. So you, you want to temper your reaction to this, this bo dream box. So sorry, mm -hmm. I have a question. Also, no, no worries. So this is to, today's topic is actually one of six sessions that we're going to be having on a weekly basis. And today's topic was about vision and how can you set the right vision for yourself in order for you to reach your goals, whether it's on a career level or a personal level. So just to wrap up the five traits and chain, please correct me if I'm wrong. I'm, I'm trying to memorize them. So first of all, it's uh, focusing on your personality traits the strongest skills that you have, your energizing or de-energizing uh, activities that you can just have a pen and paper and anything that kind of like stirs energy in you, you could write it down. Then you have your values and we end with the motivational drivers. Is that right? I got it? Yes. And that's just the exercise for you to like understand like what direction you want to go. But then I yeah. would say the core thing is to not be realistic. Because you're setting a vision, you're setting a dream, and there's no point in having a dream that's real, that's based in reality. Because the definition of a dream is to, to use your imagination and set something that's so big yeah. that it seems unachievable. And, you know, that's how we put people on, you know, like Elon Musk is trying to colonize Mars, for example. You know, it, when he set that goal, it must have seemed impossible. And today, it's actually you know, very, it's very possible that can happen. Mm -hmm. So, so set, use this to kind of understand where, you, what the general direction you should be going in and then set a huge goal. Like Roy, Roy Kroc, the founder of McDonald's did when he said, we're going to be the number one restaurant in the world, like strive to be number one. And remember that Kentucky fried chicken is not the best chicken, but yeah. it is the best chicken. Mm -hmm. Remember yeah. that you don't have to be great to be great. It's, it's, it's mind blowing concept, but that's the other thing. And that's what my next exercise, I don't know if we have time for one more exercise or how are we doing? Right. Do you want to, do you want to? Yeah, we can go for a quick exercise. Okay, this one, uh, you took the slide off before that. I don't know if that was by design or slide number 20. There we go. This is a uh, unusual uh, slide and it's called Heaven's Gate. And uh, so um, basically when I had this, uh, the green shake, I don't know if you know him, he's one of the shakes of Ajman on my radio show. He said, Shane, I really like death. And I said, what do you, uh, uh, what do you mean? And he said, I have my entourage bury me alive once a year. And I said, why? And he said, because I watch my life flash before my eyes and I feel like I'm being buried and like what it will be like when I'm dead. And then he gets them pulled out and he has the ambulance there and everything. So he almost, you know, like it's pretty intense. 
And, uh, and then uh, if you look at the next slide, I actually found some quotes from Steve Jobs, who also stated the same thing, saying that death was the best tool for his life. And what happens is you really, uh, you know, you really look at um, slide 21 here. Uh, if you look at it, he, he says that, he, you know, you realize that your time is finite. And what are you going to do with it? And what are you going to do with the next five years? It really counts because you might only work for another 30 years or 20 years or so. You know, it's like a basketball game. You're not, you only have four quarters or five quarters. You're not going to throw, throw one away. And uh, so basically what he said uh, is that remembering I'll be dead soon is the most important tool I've ever encountered to help me make the big choices in life, said Jobs. Uh, death is very likely the single best invention of life. It's a life change event. So obviously the logic there is self-explanatory, but if we go then to slide 22, what the exercise is with no further ado is to imagine your funeral and pick a date when you die. So in this particular case, the person has picked 102. You could pick whatever. It doesn't matter what age you pick, 70, 80, yeah. 90, uh, whatever you want to say. Just pick a date and then imagine what they say about you at your funeral, write your eulogy. And it's a very important tool to say, hey, how do you want to be remembered? What is it that you really want to accomplish? Well, I want to have an orphanage. Well, if you want to have an orphanage, that means you need to be very successful uh, financially. So maybe that means you become a CEO. Or, so if you be a CEO, you have to achieve that by 60, by 55, you became CEO. That means by 50, you need to be regional CEO, regional director. And then you really say, okay, well, the first skill I need is sales or revenue generation because, you know, the CEO is responsible for making money. So you have mm -hmm. to understand sales and marketing. And then you have, and so then once you write this out, the second stage for that is writing a capability matrix. So at each one of these, we know what skills that we actually need to have. So, uh, uh, which is another step in it. So these, this, this will help you kind of set your vision of what is, what is it you really want and invent your life and come to the realization that we're all our own inventions. It's only the successful people among us that admit it. And, uh, right. yeah, so I find this is a really good exercise. And then the next stage of this exercise, if you're working with us is we would put a capability map on there. So. Uh, so say you're working in sales, your company doesn't give you P&L or profit and loss responsibility or budget responsibility. So then at nighttime, you would you would say, look, this is a critical skill I need to develop for my next move. And I'm going to have I'm going to take ownership of my own development. And these are the skills that I'm going to develop. And I'm, so my next. So you always know what the next uh, skill set and capability you're developing in order to prepare yourself for the next role. So. In order to get to your goals, the first step that we're going to do is getting to the right vision or setting the vision for yourself. So this is the theme of today's uh, topic. So this is one of six. We're going to be live with you for the next six weeks. And each session, we're going to be talking about something in order for you to manage the right career. So this brings us to the end of our live session. We hope that you found it useful and that you found it informative. We'd like to thank you all for tuning in and a special thank you to Shane Phillips for this interesting discussion. Uh, he's a career coach and the CEO of the management consultancy, the Phillips Group. So stay tuned for our next session on this career management topic. So until then, stay safe, stay healthy and have a wonderful day.